Uh, we would like to welcome all of you to our SACS uh, first webinar. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we hope uh, you and your family are healthy and safe during these uncertain and unprecedented times. We know it's a very difficult time and uh, one way or the other, everyone has been affected by this COVID-19. As uh, most of you, we also hope this won't last long and everything will be back to normal and we will be able to enjoy the summer outdoors with friends and families. Uh, we have had uh, numerous uh, in-person seminars, uh, seminars and conferences over the last 17 years. Uh, we Canadians and especially South Asians, uh, we love each other and enjoy these in-person seminars and the networking opportunities. But currently, not only in Canada, globally, everyone is practicing the social distancing to vanquish uh, this tiny enemy, coronavirus. So it's a necessity of this time for our association to seek a practical way of delivering our services. Following the lead of many other organizations worldwide, we resorted to Zoom platform to reach out to you. We are looking forward to meeting all of you again in person, so as uh, everything back to normal. Hope you would, be, you would be benefited uh, from this webinar uh, that is aimed to answer many of uh, your questions. Today's presentation uh, about COVID-19 tax update is going to be presented by Manu Kaka. He's a CPA, CA, CGA, TEP, and MTAX. He's, uh, he's a very familiar face to our members as he has done uh, many informative tax seminars for SAC number of times in the past. Manu has uh, more than 18 years of experience in the taxation in both domestic and international, personal and corporate taxation, as well as expert witness reports and testimony. He runs his own independent tax practice with an office in Montreal serves a diverse client base uh, that I know is. Uh, his firm acts as a counsel to more than 100 professional firms in Canada and US. Manu is an award-winning prolific uh, tax writer. His Master of Taxation thesis on butterfly reorganizations won two awards uh, and was published in the Canadian Tax Journal. Manu has published and presented more than 200 tax articles and presentations since 2001 across Canada. He is an authority in taxation as his name has been cited 19 times in the Income Tax Act. Yes, you heard it right, 19 times in the Income Tax Act. Manu has taught tax at CPA, Chartered Professional Accountants, the Canadian Tax Foundation, the Society of Trust and Estate Practitioners, Certified General Accountants, and various principal accounting bodies across Canada. Manu sits on the steering committee for CPA Canada's The One uh, National Conference, the Canadian Tax Foundation Laval Program Committee, CPA Canada's Small and Medium Practitioners Tax Committee, and the Canadian Foundation's Ontario Tax Conference. He is currently serving a three-year term uh, on the Canadian Tax Foundation Board of Governors. It is my pleasure to welcome uh, Manu to do the presentation. Uh, over to you, Manu. We can't give a big round of applause here, but uh, with his exuberant faces, uh, he will read that. Uh, Manu? I think he's muted, right? Right now, Let me find out. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Are my, am I good? Yes, good. yes, we can hear you. I can hear you, but you yeah. can't see me now. So I don't know where is my video. Um, yeah, yeah, we can see you. We can see you. You can see the screen. Oh, I can. Okay. I, I can't see you. That's probably good. So, okay. So, <laughs> so that's okay. So a um, couple of little updates to my bio. So first of all, thank you very much for everybody being here. Um, uh, just a little bit. So a couple of things. First of all, the slide I, I have here, um, the one that I sent to all of you is the same, except that 
this one for some reason I can't find the other one right now. It's okay. It says that it's for the Sri Lankan Accountants Association or SAC, where this one that we have doesn't. But the rest of the slides are the same. I'm not going to go find it right now. But you have, correct me if I'm wrong. Your members have. I've already sent you guys through Dave um, or Teva the other slides. You guys have it right with you. Yeah, we have the first Okay, slide. so that's yeah. fine, but we'll just, the slide is a little different on the first page, doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, the second thing I'd also mention, just a little update to my bio, um, things I guess that I, I must have been younger when I gave you that bio. So um, I, don't, I not only have an office in Montreal, we also have one in Toronto as well. Uh, we're based in Mississauga uh, near the airport. We have two tax people working there. We're a team right now of five working in Montreal and Toronto. And the other thing is just to update um, myself is that I'm going, I've gone a little bit older. So now I'm cited 31 times in the Income Tax Act, not 19. Just, I guess, shows I'm getting older. Just an FYI. Okay. Um, so that was that. So now um, tax changes related to COVID. Um, and you guys can see me. It's great. I don't know why I can't see you guys. I don't know why, but that's okay. You can see your screen. So I'm you, can see, you can see, you can see myself. Okay, cool. All right. So that's fine. So what we'll do is that, um, we're just going to go through, uh, this and, um, and basically, uh, what happens here is that, uh, um, that, that basically, uh, we're going to run through a variety of slides that, uh, we've done and, um, and basically in the variety of slides, uh, we're gonna run through these slides and uh, what I'm trying to do is focus more on questions. Um, we did a webinar recently, actually the webinar other one I did was with Jay Goodis of Tax Templates that his name is there as well, uh, cause I wanna give him credit because he helped develop the slides with me uh, as well. And, um, and what happens is, is that what we wanna do is run through this in about 45 minutes and then leave the rest for questions. Who's the moderator going to be? Is it Suresh or is it someone else? Or who's the moderator? Yeah, I'll, I, I'll, we will be jointly doing uh, the moderating like uh, me and uh, Mayuran and Eri. No worries. Yeah, no problem. So yeah. what we'll yeah. do is then we'll, I, I will leave the floor open to questions. Um, we did the webinar on uh, Tuesday. We had 152 questions. And so I'll welcome the questions. We're going to run through this relatively quickly and then I'll stay and answer the questions. And I think it'll probably be beneficial to your members. And I understand there's about 60 members online right now. Is that right? Uh, we have uh, 78. 77 wow. or 78. Yeah. Wow. Good. Okay. So we're yeah. going to go through this pretty quickly. So let's start now. This is a perfect slide as we're all feeling this way, you know? And so, um, First of all, you know, give uh, our first focus is to make sure that the healthcare, the frontline healthcare workers are, 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 are doing their job and we have to help everyone else by social distancing and we hope everyone is safe uh, and uh, everyone is healthy. That's the most important thing. So what's happened with tax deadlines? Well, what we've said is that, and again, just that you know, this is a moving target. Um, I've had two people on my team, one in Toronto, one in Montreal. Uh, work with me on in our on our website, by the way, just that you know, which is www.cucker.com, which is in I think in the back of my slides. Um, we have uh, uh, it's www uh, my last name dot my last name dot com, uh, and and so we uh, have a COVID memo that we update every week, and so we just set up this today. Um, what this is much more detailed what we have it we sort of put here on your slides as of today and this is our second version of the memo and we expect there be multiple versions so anyone wants to go to my website and check it out um for on a go forward basis you can more than welcome do that um so what this has done is that as we know we've extended t1 filing deadlines for personal tax filing deadlines to june 1st 2020 payments are due on september 1st 2020 uh, installment payment of June 15th is now been extended to September 1st, 2020. Similar rules for self-employment income except T1 filing deadline is still June 15th. Revenue Quebec is offering the same relief. Corporations with filing deadlines between March 18th, uh, 2020 and May 31st, 2020. Now the T2 filing deadline is extended to June 1st, 2020, which is uh, important. Um, corporations with amount due between March 18th, 2020 and May 31st, 2020. Well, Payment deadline of only part one tax is extended to September 1st, 2020. What that means is let's say you have a September year end, which I had a lot of them. The balance due was not due March 31st, 2020. It was due December 31st, 2020, which means the balance was still due, but the interest from March 18th, 2020 to March 31st, 2020 was deferred, right? The interest was deferred. Now, what's happening is, is that um, part one tax 
is only extended. There are other types of income tax we deal with, which is part four, part 6.1. They don't have extensions, okay, which is very important, which means on your corporate tax return, when you do it, um, you have to make sure that it was only the part one. You have to bifurcate or split out what's the part one tax and what's the part four tax. There's the most other non part one tax you get. And the part four tax was still due in during this period. Um, it's still under debate from CRA whether they're going to extend deadlines on that. I don't know why they're not, but they're, but they are, they have not, they've only given relief to part one tax. Revenue Quebec is offering the same relief as above. Trust with year ends of December 31st, 19, T3 filing deadlines extend to May 1st. Uh, T3 sub filing deadline May 1st, payment deadline is September 1st. Okay. Uh, similar theme again for due dates, trust with T due dates on April 2020 or May 2020. Quebec, I'm not going to get into this too much because you guys are not from Quebec, but I'm just leaving it here. Uh, other deadlines, partnerships with year ends of December 31st, 19, T53, 13 return, filing deadline extended to May 1st, 2020. Remain silent on 2019 T50 13 returns that are due on May 31st, 2020. Um, partnerships with year ends other than December 31st, 2019. Um, CRA has remained silent on this point. Okay. NR4 slips, which are due for Part 13 tax remittance, have been extended to filing deadlines have been extended to May 1st, 2020. Remittances, though, have to be made on time, which is usually the 15th of the following month. Information returns, T1135s for the $100,000 specified property rules, uh, specified foreign property rules, and uh, 1134s. Basically, if they were due between March 18, 2020 and June 1st, 2020, they're, they're now, oh, sorry, until May 31st, 2020, we should say. They're extended to June 1st, 2020. Okay, so there's been extensions uh, all across the board. I find it actually quite difficult as an account to remember the extensions. So my general rule is try to still file on time if you can, um, because it's important because I mean, it's hard to remember these extensions. Someone was asking me today, what was the personal tax payment extension? And I have to go back and check, well, the payment is due September 1st, but the return is due June 1st. So it's just always try to file on time as much as possible. That's what we're doing in our firm. Administrative measures. This is this is confirmed by unofficial but very reliable sources that, sources that all returns, forms, elections, designations, requests for information that would be due between March 18, 2020, and June 1st and June 1st, 2020, which is really May 31st, 2020, are extended to June 1st, 2020. Exceptions to this extension are payroll deductions. Um, I know I had to just file my payroll, so my payroll was still due when it's due. And SRND shred RND tax filings. There's an 18 month extension, and that is still not extend it because of this. We have to file on time because that's based on legislation and they cannot undo the legislation. Commodity tax, certain extensions on remaining HST, GST are available depending on the frequency of the filer. All QST remains are now due between March 31st, 2020 and May 31st, 2020 are now due on June 30th, 2020. Um, if balances cannot be paid for COVID reasons but have not been specifically addressed in relief measures, CRA has commented they will review fairness applications to waive the interest on a case-by-case -case basis. So what happens is we therefore assume like in my September 30th, 2020 year end, sorry, September 30th, 19 year end, the interest would continue to accrue on unpaid amounts due prior to March 18th, 2020 and between March 18th, 2020 and March 31st, 2020 for my September 30th year ends, we would be good. We wouldn't, we'd have no interest. Um, CBA, this is interesting. So we're moving rather quickly, which is not what I want. There'll be loans provided to small businesses on an interest-free basis. The loans are being implemented by most chartered banks. It actually started today. Um, I know today, last night, the banks were open for this. And each bank has their own application process. Um, and the national banks, as I said, have begun accepting of applications today, April 9th, 2020, on an online basis. Loans will be available to a maximum of $40,000. To qualify, entities have to have a payroll between $50,000 and $1 million in 2019 based on their T4 summary. The government has been silent on any further guidance to what who qualifies. Uh, what if the company was in a startup phase in 2019 or only paid dividends in 2019? There's been no guidance on CBA on, in this regard. Okay, There's been nothing in this regard. Repaying the loan by December 31st, 2022 will result in loan forgiveness of 25%. So basically, if you borrow 40, you have to repay 30% on a non-interest bearing basis by December 31st, 2022. The other 10% will be considered to be income, sorry, 25% will be considered to be income to be taxed in the company as government assistant, we presume, under 12.1x of the Act. Um, if the loan cannot be repaid, the 30,000 in this case, out of this, which is 75% of the 40, cannot be repaid by the state, will likely be converted into an interest-bearing term loan. Okay, so it's quite good. Uh, those of you who are professional corporations uh, would likely qualify for this if you feel the need. Obviously, don't be greedy. If you don't need the money from a policy perspective, you shouldn't grab it, right? That's just 
I mean, my own personal viewpoint on this, because I know, for instance, I do technically qualify for this, but we are not taking it. My family's not taking it because we feel there's other people who would probably need it. So that's just something as a moral perspective you should be thinking about. Um, the CERB. Um, this is the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. It is an EI-based benefit. Uh, it's a benefit of $2,000 per four-week period to a maximum of 16 weeks will be available. Individuals apply for the CERB four weeks at a time. Um, and so what happens is to qualify, you have to, based on the legislation, individuals must meet the following conditions. Resident of Canada, having reached 15 years of age, earned at least $5,000 from employment, self-employment, or maternity, maternity paternal, parental leave during the 12-month period prior to applying. Does not to be earned from the same sort as the immediate pre-COVID employment income. We'll get into this in a second. Ceased work because of illness or job, not resignation for 14 consecutive days and without income for those 14 consecutive days in that period. So what's interesting though, is that if you look at the law, the law says it's for the first application period, you have to be not getting income for 14 days and not working for 14 days. Where Sierra says is, well, that only applies for the first application period and for the other application periods, which is the second, third and fourth application period, you can have no income for any of those four weeks or no income. But the law doesn't say that. The law says for every application period, you have to have be not working for 14 days and not getting income. So there's a bit of a discrepancy in what CRA is saying and what the law is saying. We hope for greater clarification, right? Um, the $5,000 income, uh, and they use the word total income here. They said that the uh, initially total income included income from employment and income from self-employment. And now what they did as of Monday, they said, well, the $5,000 income test or total income test um, recently didn't include the dividends, but as of Monday now they said, yes, it does include ineligible dividends, not eligible dividends um, for, that, uh, for that period. So, um, so, that's very, uh, so that's very a relieving provision that you don't have to worry about now getting, if you are getting, paying yourself as an owner manager as dividends, if you were paying ineligible dividends and it was at least $5,000 in either, and it's not in my slides, but in either 2019 or the 12 month period prior. So it's an either or test, then we would be good. Okay, so what's interesting here is I get a question a lot the last couple of days. What about students? What happens if students earn $5,000 of income, employment income last summer? They got fired from their part-time job this summer. Can they qualify for the CERB technically based on this? Yes, because the $5,000 was uh, previously from other employment. They got laid off from this year's employment because of CERB and they can prove that, then go ahead, you know, that, that works. So it's just an interesting thing for students. We're hoping to get more, um, uh, more help for the students because there could be cases where students don't, it doesn't work, but that's how, it, that's how the situation for students are right now. Just a question, Manu. Uh, yeah. like if, if like uh, most of the students, uh, the university students, uh, they will start their work uh, in May, right? Yeah. So if, if suppose uh, they got an offer and uh, if it, it was withdrawn uh, because of the COVID-19, yeah. do they still qualify? They could, but then they have to apply because there's application periods. You have to apply and it's on the website with the details. You have to wait to apply till May, till not May, now. Yeah. Because what happens is it starts from, I'll pop my head, March 15th or March 18th, 2020 to October 2nd, 2020. So that means for the first application period, which is, let's say now, starting April 6th, they can't apply. But mm. what they could apply is for May. It's May, okay. But they have to meet the $5,000 employment income test. The last prior, prior in, 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 Or in 2019. Right, right, okay. In the slide, it doesn't say 2019, or it's an or test. Yeah, it's a good question. And I, want, I welcome these questions. Please ask the questions. Like I said, I'm going through the slides relatively quickly because you can read this online. Or if you don't, you can have more detail if you want. Go to my website, www.cucker.com and pick up the most recent COVID memo. There's two of them. Um, there's about 20 pages of memo. So this, this is more just these type of questions that we're going to ask. Okay. So we start on April 6th, applying through Service Can or CRA. Uh, you should be setting up the individuals have to set up the online CRA accounts ASAP. And again, even though it goes from, I believe it's March 15th or March 18th to October 2nd, you can make applications until December 2nd. I have a question, Manu. Yeah. Uh, this is Dave here. Hey, Dave. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, hi, Dave. Yes. <laughs> I just want to know if the company pays a consistent payment, say $5,000 each month and the end of the year only, he's going to decide how much the salary is going to draw. Uh, you know, is paying five thousand dollar consistent for twelve months, and to get this, uh, you know, that uh, uh, CRB, the deduction, 
maybe I'm not the deduction. You mean the the money? It's not a deduction. Right, that's, right. that's right. So when this isn't the wage what, subsidy. This is not the wage subsidy. We're not talking wage subsidy, which is CEWS. We're not talking about that yet. Okay. No. I, okay. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. No, I'll go for the next one. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, yeah. Let, okay. let me come to that. This is diff okay. this is important. So, are we good with this, Dave? Or you want to talk about? Do you have a question on this or no? Uh, no, not going. So, just okay, no problem. Any other questions? Uh, yes, uh, yes, Manu. What if one works in those fourteen days, but is paid ninety days later? Can they apply that? Uh, that includes um, the fourteen days. Sorry. So, repeat the question again. Is that you're saying that? What you... if one works in those fourteen consecutive days? Let's yeah. say seven days or so, but is paid ninety days later. Yeah. Can that, uh, can the application period include that fourteen days for which he or she is not paid, for which they are paid ninety days later? Yeah. So let me answer your question this way. So let's say in the fourteen day period starting March fifteenth, right? So let's say yes. you were um, you were working in this period, right? You were working yes. in this period. But then you were, um, you then as stopped working. Yes, as a contractor. Yes, as a contractor. As a contractor. Yeah, as a contractor. When you stop working April 1st, right? So let's say yes. you stop working April 1st, but you get paid between for March, for March 15th to, to March 31st. You get paid, let's say, in July. Yes. Right? Yes. So, so the question is that, yes, if you're getting, if you're now stopped working from April, May, and July, April, May, and June, July, right? So let's mm -hmm. say 16 weeks, and you're getting payment. The, the, the idea of the payment is, is if you look at the technical wording in the legislation, is that you can't receive payment for the period in which you are not working. So the idea is that you're not working from April to July. You're right. not getting any payments from April to July. You're getting a right. payment in July for something that happened when you were working, you do qualify. Right. Yes. Oh, I see. Okay. So can it makes sense because what you're saying is, let's say my sense, let's say now I, let's say I, I invoice because I, I work with Dave. So I'm going to pick on Dave. I work with Dave. I invoice Dave. And let's say now for some reason I stop working today, right? Today is April 9th. Right. right. I stopped working today for 14 consecutive days, but I've invoiced Dave today for work I did in March. And he only pays me because Dave is a slow pair. No, I'm just kidding. He's a great pair. Dave only pays me at the end of April. Right. I can still get them. I can still get it because the payment is not in respect to the period I wasn't working. The payment is in respect to the period I was working. Oh, I see. Okay. okay. It's a very good question, actually. Okay. So thank you. What's your name, ma'am? Thank you. Vasanti. Vasanti, pleasure. I think I know you. I met you before. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. 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 There's another question, Manu. Yeah. Like uh, if somebody is asking uh, if he quit the job in last November and yeah. earned it, if I earned more than $5,000. An employment job or a net or a contractor job? Employment. employment. It looks yeah. like an employment job. Okay. And uh, he's not uh, eligible for EI because he quit the job. Yeah. Will he be uh, uh, eligible for this uh, CERB? No. The question is that if you would only be eligible for EI, yeah, because because you're not eligible for EI if you quit. You're you're not eligible. You're eligible if you let 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 go. So mm -hmm. the question is now if you have if you you have there's two prong tests. I can be. Um, getting, if I had $5,000 of employment income last year in mm -hmm. 2019, and I had a job this year and I was let go because of COVID, or I was sick because of COVID, or I had to take care of someone who was like, I had to take care of someone because of COVID, or I had to take care of my kids who were let go of, who are now sitting at home. Mm -hmm. It's in the current job. If he doesn't have a current job where he was let go, he doesn't get it. He doesn't get the SERP. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? You need a two prong test. Right, right, right. Hopefully that answers the question. Hopefully yeah. that answers the question. Yeah. 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 Okay. Any other questions? Serb is, I was surprised. I was, when I gave the webinar this week, uh, Serb was the most popular topic. I was very surprised. I thought it'd be the subsidy, but the subsidy wasn't that popular. Yeah. yeah. Ask the questions uh, as we go. Yeah. Hello, Manu. Sorry, Manu. I just uh, want to know whether if seasonal workers, suppose in a last winter, uh, I have a winery, they work in up to November or December. Yeah. Now they let them go. Can they apply for us? Uh, this uh, sure. Serb. Yes. That won't count because they didn't lose work because of their uh, the COVID. Oh, they have to okay. have lost work because of COVID, right? That's all good. Okay. That's yeah. all. Okay. Hello, Manu. Yeah. Hello, Manu. Uh, my name is Sudan. Can nice. I ask you a question? Sure. Yeah. Uh, this is regarding like a small business trucking company and all. Yeah. They The hours are reduced and they are not getting enough pay. And it's going to the payments are going to the corporation and they are not withdrawing any salary, but they are working. Are they eligible to apply? Who are you talking about? The owner? Yeah, owner, exactly. 
Technically, no. Oh, no, because they're still working. But they're just working reduce hours. It doesn't matter. They're still working. That's the problem with the SERP. Okay. SERB is it's there was a there was a there was a there was a presentation on TV a couple of nights ago. I was watching with my wife. You cannot be working at all and get no income at all. Zero. Okay. okay. There was a guy who had to return. There was a guy who works in the gig economy. He was a contractor. He had to turn down a three hundred dollar contract to get the SERP. Okay. You're working. You're not getting income. There's a two prong test. You cannot work. You have to cease work and no income because of SERP. Right. But so even if the money is coming to the corporation. He hasn't withdraw anything. For that doesn't Sarah matter. Okay. That does not matter. They're still working. It's the same with me. Like I can, let's say I'm building sock, let's say for this, right? And I don't take money out of the corporate. Let's say I haven't taken money now in a month. Right. I can't right. apply for the CERB. Okay. All right. Now, now what now some accountants would say to me, Hey, who's going to find out? And this is a good question. They're going to be doling out money right now, like water, mm -hmm. but watch it. What they're going to do within a year, they're going to audit you and your clients to say, Hey, Give me the proof now that you weren't working. Mm -hmm. And if you've taken money ill-gotten, they're going right. to make you pay it back. And we're going to see with the, with the CEWS, there's actually a potential like 225% penalty and five years imprisonment if you take the 75% subsidy according to Trudeau and Morno. No, exactly. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. You know what I mean? So they yeah. probably going to say, okay, they're going to give you the money now. They're not going to audit you now, but they're setting up a lot of taxpayers. And this is like a big complaint I was having with another accountant I work with a lot in Toronto yesterday night. They're mm -hmm. setting a lot of people up for audit in a year. Okay. No, I, that is my hope also. Like, I think they are not going to give it like free. They're just leaving now because of the situation and they are going to catch it later. Yeah, that's fine. I'm just saying, no, you technically can't because if you, it's the same thing. Like if you're getting money, you're just taking out money. It doesn't matter. You're still working. I understand you're working reduced hours, but the idea is that you're not working for the CERP. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. Hi, All right. my name is Ari. I have a question. Okay. Uh, I'm working in a, a retail shop and I'm scared to go to work, but my employer is asking me to come, but I don't want to go. Can I apply for the stuff? Sorry. So this is a question someone's asking. Yeah. So if someone, the guy is working in a retail shop, but the guy doesn't want to go. That's right. He doesn't want to go because he's scared. Well, that means he's, um, yeah, he's scared. Um, the question is, and let me actually, let me just do something here. Let me just get the legislation here. So everyone, I forgot, the, I left my legislation in my bag. I apologize. So if you look at the CERB legislation, what it says technically, here, here it is. Apologies again, I just left it in my bag. So uh, here it is. So CERB says, let's look at the reasons of CERB. A worker, a worker, a worker, the worker, whether employed or self-employed, ceased working for reasons related to COVID-19 for at least 14 consecutive days in the four-week period in which they were applied for the payment and did not receive anything. So yeah, if they ceased working, I think that, that it doesn't matter what the reason is. They stop, they stop. So technically, I think it works. But then he can't, can't, can't receive any income okay. for the period in which he's not working. So yeah, I don't think I, I don't think the matter of how you why you stop working matters. I think the fact you stop working is matter. So I just want to look at the legislation. I think they'd be very sympathetic to that client, that person. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hi, Manuel. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Dinesh. Um, if somebody's working full time and they had a part time job, which uh, is no longer available because of COVID-19, are they still el eligible for this benefit, even though they have a full-time job, but not their part-time job? I think the answer is no. Okay. But let me see here. Someone asked me that question before. So again, going back to the legislation, right? And keep in mind, right, that these laws change every single day. So I know in a month from now, this may be completely different. So I think that's something we have to keep in mind is whatever I'm talking to you about, if it changes, don't say, hey, Manu made a mistake, right? Because it's who knows what these laws are. So I'm just looking back at COVID. I'm just looking at this thing here. So what the law says, well, of course I can't find it now. 
My gut says I think no because uh, here. Okay, here. Let me look here. You must have stopped working. It has to stop working. Period. You have to so stop. You have to cease working. Cease working. Yeah, you cease working, right? So I'm just reading the legislation. That's what I'm. I'm trying to find here. Here it is. Uh, the worker, whether employed, ceases working for reasons. Yeah, it says ceases working, and. Oh, this is the why you get caught and they do not receive. Okay, you ceased working. So you could argue, oh, I ceased working for my part-time job, Dinesh. Yeah. Right? But they do not receive in respect of the consecutive ways in which they have ceased working from the part-time job, uh, income from employment. Yes, they are receiving income from employment. Therefore, it doesn't count. It's the, employee, it's the income test that messes you up. Okay. You're receiving income from employment. doesn't say from which job. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Manu, I, I have another question here. Okay. Uh, I don't think we're going to get past slide 17. This is great. I like it. <laughs> it's great. No, no, this is good. I, I, might, I don't have to even, I can just keep talking. That's good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how come some people who applied for SERB uh, April 6th got two payments of $2,000 and others are not, I guess. Is I it, think that's uh, a mistake. That's a mistake. I think so because I don't think, wait, wait a minute. You're supposed to get, if you applied April 6th, um, Oh, I know why is because I'm taking a guess because I didn't apply for CERB. Is it probably some people got payments because it's a four week period. And are you supposed to get, I'm just thinking, I'm not, I'm not sure. Are you supposed to get one payment for the four weeks or are you supposed to get payments every week? That I don't know. Um, I, I, know? I, I got to know that they paid uh, two payments now for the April as well as May. Oh, they paid April yeah. and May. That's a April mistake. And May. Oh, okay. They okay. made a mistake. Thank you. That I thought it was supposed. To be, I think I thought it was supposed to be one payment. That's what I'm asking. So I think it's a mistake. I think it's only one payment. But the people who have applied for EI, and then some people again applied for this benefit too. Those are the people got two payments mostly. So they probably got a double dip. It's a mistake. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Thank There's you. I didn't know that. I, I thought it was supposed to be one payment for a four week period. They're giving you one lump sum. I thought that's what they're supposed to do, but I don't know the administrative aspect of it. Don't, I mean, thank you for telling me this. So I think it's a mistake. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, oh, Manu, I heard you're going to have to pay it back. They're going to have to pay it back. Manu, I heard in the news last night yeah, that yeah. They're, they're paying in advance. So if they got two payments, it's not a mistake. Uh, one is for the prior period and one is for the future period. Prior that's period of what though? prior period, but are they paying, I'm asking, are they paying for two weeks or are they paying for four? They're paying for four weeks. But the prior period in the future, so what they're doing is they're making April, but then you're making the thing for May is that you're not working in May, but they don't know, but you're supposed to make the payment. You're supposed to make the application, I thought, every four weeks. Yeah, so they're paying for four weeks. They're, I mean, two, uh, they're paying but for April. April let's say they pay for now. They're paying April, but they're paying in advance for May. What I, what the way exactly. I read it was that they're supposed to, you're supposed to make the application every four weeks. Exactly. Okay. I think it's a mistake. They might be either offsetting against the second reporting or they might. Yeah, yeah, it's a mistake because you're supposed to apply every four weeks. Okay. That's what I thought. But look, this is a moving target. So thank you for telling me this. I, I you know, I'm not, I'm not pretending to know everything. Okay, let's go to the other slides, please. Um, Any more slides? <laughs> this is a popular question. I can just stop the presentation here. We can just gup shop for the rest of the two hours, right? <laughs> this man yeah, go yeah, to yeah. one last question. I think. Uh, is this two thousand dollar payment is on top of the regular EI payment? No. No. Okay. You can't double dip. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, people, we've talked about this, so listen. Let's just move on. So uh, we can. Okay, we're, this is procedurally. How do you go on the online and how you do it? You can look online to do this. Uh, we've talked about this. Those who applied for EI for COVID-related benefits after March 18, 2020, have not begun receiving benefits. Will have their claim automatically transferred to CERB. Those uh, who have already been receiving EI for regular or sickness business should not apply for EI, CERB until EI is ended. CERB will be taxable in 2020 and there's no withholdings on the CERB. So you'll pay the full amount um, in, in your 2020 T1 when it's filed in 2021. Here are the examples of people who can benefit. People who must stop working due to COVID and do not have access to paid leave or other income. People who are sick, quarantine or take care of someone who is sick. Working parents who stay home to take, look at sick kids or have take care of their kids. Workers been temporarily laid off. Um, and then we talk contract workers not eligible for EI, right? Um, so, like a, this is just a clarification. So if somebody leaves uh, because of the fear of COVID nineteen, then they will they would not qualify for this, right? No, someone asked me that. They're they're saying they're not working, they're not employed or ceases working for reasons related to COVID. They don't say why. What is that? They're very very brave. Like one person said, someone is scared. Someone yeah, doesn't like want to come to work. 
I mean, it's broad. The problem is it's a broad legislation. It's going to be interesting to see how CRA interprets this. We don't know. But the legislation doesn't say what the reason is. You say, look, it's COVID related. Now, obviously, if I'm an auditor and I come and audit you and they say, why did you leave? And you said, I'm scared. They're going to ask you, where's the proof? All right, right. Right. I send an email to my boss saying I am not coming to work because I am scared for COVID. No, no, no. The people who deal with the customers or like we deal with no, the I know, but you better have proof. I'm just saying if I was your accountant, I'd say, give me the proof. Mm -hmm. You need to have a document saying the employer is saying I am not bringing this guy back because of COVID. You need to have proof for that. The issue is not whether it's good or not. What the reasons are good is, do you have the proof? And when they come and audit you for your CERB in a year, the reason you left the job was because that's where I think is going to be a huge, huge point where Sierra is going to attack people and say, you have to give the CERB back. Right, right. You need the proof. And I, I don't know if any of you are in public practice. Whenever I'm dealing with CRA or I, I defend the case, I'm always telling people, assume you get audited tomorrow, have your proof. Right? So, so this is kind of where we're examples. Some issues and uncertainties, right? Uh, so now, um, one of them is, again, if you look at, these are some technical points in the first point. Um, again, we talked about receiving erroneous payments or overpayments. You know, you need to, you know, try to repay it back uh, as soon as possible. They will likely offset amounts. If they owe you money and you owe them money, they're going to likely offset SERB against that. Number, the, the third point from the bottom is employees should keep records on why they lost their jobs letter for employer or whatever, keep records. Um, this is interesting now, the interaction of CERB and the 75%. Is an employer cannot make a claim for the 75% wage subsidy and the employees receiving the CERB for the same period. Based on recent pronouncements, this flip-flopped this up until last night. Uh, the employer can only claim the wage subsidy, the, the CEWS, if an employee has been paid for 14 or more days during a period, while the employee, during, during the pre-application period, right, prior to while the employee can claim survey was unpaid for 14 consecutive days. So now there's a distinction, right? So if you've been paid, you can't claim. You have to get the, you're going to go under CEWS, right? Keep your job. But if you are getting paid, you can't claim the CERB. They remain silent whether the same condition exists for the 10% wage subsidy or not, right? So it's not sure if you get the, can you claim a 10% wage subsidy and get the CERB, right? But, but that's, to me, it doesn't make sense. Why would they allow you to get the CERB if you are employed. Because CERB is like EI, it's a benefit based, the EI based benefit, but they've remained silent on this. So this is what we're trying to explain to you why there's so many questions. And it's so funny, like, you know, um, um, I, I find like I'm so running behind every day because I get bombarded with these type of questions all day long, right? Uh, so this is, this is, and it's because the law is very uncertain. Um, what's interesting here is now individuals that were remunerated in 2019 by surplus stripping. Does anyone know what surplus stripping is? It's you get remuneration by capital gains, right? So you get a capital dividend or you do a surplus trip to trigger a capital gain in your hands or you get eligible dividends would be failing the $5,000 test, right? Because it only applies for ineligible dividends. So you have to be careful. So what you then have to do if you want to fall into the CERB and you only got, let's say, eligible dividends the year before, you then have to pay yourself a salary from the company and get yourself, let's say for March, pay yourself a salary in March, remit now before April 15th to qualify for the prior 12 months. Okay, so that's a very important test for the $5,000. Here's some examples. And now that you guys are so popular, you love CERB so much, here's some examples. And why don't you tell me what the answer is, okay? So Shuri, why don't you read what the example one is? I can't hear you. Your voice, we can't hear you. You're on mute, Suresh. Yeah, You're on yeah. mute. Hey, Suresh. Yeah, yeah. Hey. Com the company has ceased operations uh, for COVID. Yeah. Company has the following monthly payroll. Dad has four thousand dollars. Mom one thousand six hundred sixty-seven. Son mm -hmm. is one thousand seven hundred dollars. Daughter is seven hundred dollars, and it's all arm's length uh, employees. Oh, no, one arm's length employee, two thousand one hundred dollars. Yeah. Consider laying off mom, son, and daughter. So let's, no, let's okay. What are, let's talk right now because you're okay. the you're 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 one of the executive. So you're a hundred times smarter than me because I was never on the executive anything. Yeah. Um. What would you do? How would you advise a client what to do? Claim. So how many people here right now are there right now? Everyone. One. We. Everyone else. Satish. Everyone else can participate too. How many people are right now? We're looking at how many employees. Five. Okay. So what would you do? Would you tell people to apply for the CERB or not apply for the CERB? That's a basic question. I actually got this question from an accountant, so I put the question on. It's a very basic question, but it's very complicated. How much is CERB? 
How much is it per month? $2,000. Right? Okay. Are there any limitations? Are there any lesser of amounts or anything when I told you when I talked about the CERB? Did you, does it matter how much you were paid before or not? 12, uh, last 12 months, it's $5,000 should have been paid. No, no, but does it matter that am I restricted by the amount of salary that mom and dad or son were earning? Is that like with the other, with the, the wage subsidy, do you have a restriction on how much would you money you can get? Is the CERB restricted based no. on the monthly income of the people? I'm not talking, forget about the $5,000, assuming no, that. No, no, yeah. No restriction. No restrictions. So we're accountants here, right? Right? We're not artists. We're not poets. So if mom, son, and daughter are getting less than $2,000 a month, and assuming they meet the $5,000 2019 test or the $5,000 cumulative 12-month rolling back test, would you apply for the CERB? How much yes. is the CERB? Yes, mom, son, and daughter will apply. Yeah, they're going to get more money with the CERB than they get on their own for their own payroll. Makes no, does it make any sense? Yeah. No, it makes no sense. Why would the government pay you more money than what you're earning? Mm -hmm. Makes no sense. But this is what the law says. There's no restriction. There's no cap. They, they don't say if son makes lesser than $2,000 a month, they only get $1,700. bucks. does not say that. So they're actually better off, mom, son, and daughter, right? Because if you think about the 75% wage subsidy, it is – you get, there's a restriction. We're going to look at the limits. It's a lesser of 75% of the wage for non-arms length employees. It's, 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 it's the, it's the 75% of what's paid. What was your pre-crisis income and 847 or 845 bucks a week. Son's getting less than that. So if we said, son, apply for $2,000, I'm not getting the CERB. Uh, you don't work. You're better off because 75% of 2000 of 1700 is how much? 1200 or something, right? But the son, you see my point? So the point of the matter is you consider laying off mom, son, and daughter because they're better off receiving 2000 because it's more than what they're getting right now per month. Company could claim the 10% subsidy for the employee, the arm's length employee, right? Because it's a good way of getting cash provided you're a CCPC, okay? Could also claim 75% for the employee, right? The arm's length employee, right? Because he's more than $2,000 a month, right? And for dad, they're probably better off because if we're claiming the 75%, because right now dad stays on the payroll for four grand, the key only company only pays a thousand bucks for him and they get a, a grand for 3000. So this is why I was telling you, this is not an easy, like this is, sim this is like a simple fact pattern, but it's not that simple, right? So understand now what I told you for the son, mom, and daughter that we don't care about the wage subsidies because they're getting more money in their pocket without working than what they were earning. But understand that because it's draft legislation right now, it might be changed, okay? The 75% subsidy for dad we based on pre-crisis remuneration. What that means is, so let's say, for instance, dad was getting $4,000 pre-crisis, pre-COVID. You can't go back and, re and up his salary now to $6,000 a month. They're, they're cutting you off prior to what he got prior to COVID, right? That's important. for Now, for an arm's length employee, let's say the 2100 guy, you can increase his salary during COVID. They'll pay you more money but not for the non-arms length. Now, obviously for an arm's length employee, you would never do that. You'd probably keep his salary the same. So again, uh, government has made a general comment that an employer cannot double dip on 10 and 75%. They're saying that the 10% subsidy will grind the 75% subsidy. They haven't explained how this will work. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. The 75% subsidy is also restricted only for CCPCs or all corporations? It says all corporations. And the 10% is only for CCPCs, right? No, not 100% right. I'll come to that in a second. Okay. Let me come to that in a second, okay? okay. It's not 100% right. Some CCPCs don't get it. You have to have a business limit allocated to you, okay? So self-employed real estate agent had gross commissions, so had gross commissions greater than $5,000, reported a loss after the expenses. Does she meet the $5,000 income threshold to claim CERB? What do you think? So they reported a loss, but they had $5,000 gross. The left foot legislation refers to total income, but there's no definition of this term, nor is total income defined in the act. But total income appears on line 150 of the T1 which at that point you report the net self-income, net self-employment income rather than gross. Further, for CPP and certain EI benefits for self-employed workers, they're based on net income, not gross. So we would assume the CERB is also based on net income for self-employment people, 
But employment person's income, we presume it's based on gross. So you see a trick on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, this is a gray zone. So when you're advising someone who's self-employed, you have to ask them, well, you know, it's better to be safe. You have $5,000 net, right? So again, this is another example I got from someone. This is not, these are not fake examples. This is, you can look at this, is pretty real. CCPC is two fifty fifty owners. First year of business was 2019. There was no remuneration paid at the date. Now, what happened is the first owner manager had a, had a different job before he started his startup and he got 5,000 gross. Second owner manager had nothing, okay? First owner manager could qualify for the CERB, second could not because they paid, they could argue that he got employment from another job at $5,000. Even though his current job, he was let go because of COVID, he paid nothing. So you see the issue here? $5,000, he was he let go for whatever reason, doesn't matter in 2019, but his current job, he can't work because he has, it's because of COVID. So his current job is not paying him anything, but he got the $5,000 from somewhere else. You don't qualify for SIBA because there's no payroll test in 2019, you don't meet it. Your 10% wage subsidy is likely available, okay? It's a, it's a CCPC and it has a business limit allocated to it, which we're gonna to come to in a sec. And the 75% wage subsidy is only available if there's a drop in revenue test is met, which we are gonna talk about. So let's go to the question the gentleman asked about CCPCs. Why, did, it has to have a business limit allocated to it. What's the business limit? It's a small business. 25. What is it? 25. 25? Who said 25? Sorry, Manu, what was your question? What is the business limit? 500,000. 500,000. So what the law says is I have to be a CCPC and I have to be allocated in the prior year a business limit. Or if I don't have a prior year in the current year, I have to be allocated business limits. I have to be allocated 500,000. What type of income do I have to have for a CCPC to be allocated $500,000 of business limit? Active business income. Okay, let's do a poll. Can we do a poll on Zoom right now or we can't poll? No polling? Okay. How many of you agree with Shitty? Can you pull or no? Uh, I'll check right. while you continue. You can pull. I'll check that while you can continue with what you're doing. I'll check. Okay, here's the poll. Who agrees with Shiri that to get a business limit allocated to oneself, yes or no, you need to have active business income, yes or no? Yes. Let's do the poll, man. We <laughs> voted for Trudeau, now we can vote again. Or voted not against Trudeau, doesn't matter. We voted for our Desi by Jagmeet, who knows? <laughs> Let's do a poll. Suresh likes polling because he's a social networker. So come on. So what's the poll? Who says agrees with Shitty? You can only vote once, Shitty. <laughs> For a business limit, you have to have an active business income. Yes or no? Mm, we could, we still, we couldn't find a way to get the no vote. No polling? So. Okay, let everyone just no, voice no. their opinion. Yes. There's no polling, yeah. There's no polling? That's okay. So everyone says, okay, why don't you go to the moderator with Suresh and let email Suresh your answer. Let Suresh, po let Suresh poll it for me. All right. So the thing is now, here's a better question. Let's say you have a loss. Can you have a business limit allocated to your company? You have a loss. You're a CCPC. Can I have my business limit allocated to it? No. The answer is yes. And the answer is I don't have to have active business income to have on my schedule 23, $500,000 allocated. It does not say, to answer that gentleman's question, you need to have active business income on which to apply the business limit. It just says you must have a business limit allocated to it in the prior year. So the whole thing is that if you have a company that you allocate $1 of a business limit to, you get the 10% wage subsidy. Regardless if you have active business income or not, it doesn't say that in the legislation, which makes no so sense to me. It doesn't, doesn't say like you have to use it. Right? It says, all used. it says is allocated. Allocated. So the, if a company with a passive income can uh, use that too? Technically, like a, yes. Subject to the way the law is right now. It says here, is any of a CCPC for the purpose of section 125 that would have a business limit for its last taxation that ended before the start of the eligible period greater than nil? If the, the amount determined for paragraph 125.151B were deemed to be nil. So what this means is, you can't, you have to have no tax, you have to have a small business limit that's intact, that is not ground by the lack taxable capital rules. You can't have taxable capital more than 15 million. But if you have passive income of 150,000, they don't care. But you must have a limit. It just says you must have a limit. Having does not mean using. That makes sense? Mm. 
that makes sense yeah this is how i make my living i make i, I turn off words <laughs> that's what it is having means to not use i can have a car but not use it right that's the thing so that's a trick you can have a passive rent yeah and i had a client that he had a rental income company passive he has employees he can get it we have to allocate a dollar business limit okay mm -hmm. doesn't make sense though does it but that's that's what it is okay um is the same manu for both uh, 10 percent and 75 no no no, 75 doesn't have a business limit requirement. 75%, they just said you can't be a public body. We'll get into 75%. doesn't say you have to be a CCPC. Okay. okay. As the law is today. Remember what I told you today? Maybe, maybe garbage or bakwas in, as you say, in Hindi uh, in two weeks because the law may change. Right? So let's go to the 10%. So this is where it is. This is law. Okay. Calculation definitions of deem remittance. Here's what it says. Employs one or more eligible employees. An eligible employee means an individual who's employed in Canada. A registered business number to make a remittance on March 18, 2020. So you have to have a business number. You have to have an, an employer uh, payroll, right? Okay. A CCPC for the purposes of Section 125 that we said had a business limit for its last taxation year. Okay. That would not have been ground down because of the large corporation tax, the LCT grind, but could be ground down because of passive income grind. You could have an individual, a partnership, not-for-profits or a registered charity. So here's a question for you. Let's say a client of yours has a nanny, okay? Usually the wife has the nanny under her name. They have a payroll under the name. Based on this definition, can the person claim the 10% wage subsidy for the nanny? Yes or no? What do you guys think? Yes. yes. Who said yes? Yeah. Ari said yes. Why'd you say yes? Uh, they have a uh, business number and they're paying the nanny. So yeah. that's why. But there's no business. But there's no business. But well, how do they, would they get the business number without having a business? No, you can have a payroll number. You can have a payroll number without having a business. Is there a requirement based on what I've told you here in this definition to have a business? When you read it on the slide, is there a business requirement? Registered business number to make remittances. To make remittances, you have to make a payroll remittance. You can get a payroll number for a nanny who don't have a business. The answer is you don't have to have a business. The answer is yes, you can. Yep. There's no business requirement in not business number there's no carrying on business requirement under this definition for 10 percent so it's kind of dumb but an individual who has a nanny can get a 10 percent wage subsidy for the nanny okay? okay sole proprietors they're not employees of the businesses they can only claim a subsidy on remuneration paid to their employees not to themselves you can't pay a salary to yourself if i'm a sole proprietor right i get net income so that doesn't count but the salary to someone else could count ccpc must have a small business they, they limit. You must a do, allocate a dollar in the prior year. So let's say now I'm finalizing tax returns for a client with the December year end. One company has a loss. One company has income. My guy claimed $500,000 of business limit for the company that had the income. I got to go back to him now and say, hey, put the $1 back in the loss company because the loss company has employees. We can claim a, we can do SERP or no, we can do the 10%. So this is just a recent T2 I had. I got to go call the guy back and he's going to have to allocate $1 for, uh, $1 for the, um, for the, for the, for the, for the, uh, for the loss company just to get the 10% wage subsidy. You see what I mean? This is a live case. Taxable capital for associate group must be below 15 million. Uh, so how do you get the subsidy? Well, you get reduced withholdings on eligible remuneration. It is basically getting a reduction of taxes, right? You're not talking about revenue Quebec taxes, you're talking Ontario, your income taxes, whatever you're emitting, your 10% is taken off your reduction of the taxes, right? So that can start now. You can get the money now by reduced withholdings. It doesn't include CPP and EI. You don't get the reduction on that. Eligible remuneration means salary, wages, or other remuneration Sorry. paid to an eligible employee during the eligible period, which means, Sorry. just one sec, Sorry, just one sec, Sorry. just one sec. So what that means is if I accrued a bonus, no. Right? If I accrue the bonus in December, 
and I'll just a sec, Dave, I'll answer your question. And I decide to pay yeah, it in okay. June, right? I don't get the remittance requirement. I have to pay the, I have to I have to pay the accrual in March to get the remittance now. Yeah, Dave. Who asked me a question? Okay. Uh, me, Manu. Hi. Uh, in a, uh, just question. Suppose you know the pay. Okay, the person is paying uh, every every month the same uh, amount payroll remittances. Yeah. Every month. At the end of the year, we are saying okay. Uh, calculate your cash at the. I can't hear you. Sorry. Hello. Internet problem. Can I? Can people hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay. So I can, sorry. Internet, Dave, I are you there? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, sorry, I lost it. I guess. So at the end of the year, can we claim that uh, ten percent deduction rather than monthly because monthly is paying same amount over every twelve months? Uh, the legislation's silent there. Um, uh -huh. Legislation silent. I'm just looking here. Uh, yeah, it doesn't. It just says the eligible. Look, the payment date must be between March 18th and June 19th for the wage subsidy to apply. Eligible occurring remuneration occurring before March 18th is paid on or after um, March 18th will be eligible during this period. It doesn't say when you can um, it, when you can actually reclaim the remittances. Whether you can when you can reduce the remittances. But why would you do that? You would probably want to reduce remittances now to increase your cash flow. Legislation is yeah. silent in that regard. Because we won't, we won't know how much the salary you want to declare at the time of the uh, end of the year. Only we would know. No, how much no, 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 no. You have to pay the salary and know the amounts between March 18th and June 19th. You mean like you have a debit shareholder loan? Yeah. No. Okay. You have to pay it now. You have to clear it now. Okay. No. No. Okay. You can't do that. And suppose these people are paying once a year at the five thousand dollar calculation. How we are going to calculate? Suppose if the December year end. What five thousand? That's for the SERB. So yeah, the same ten percent deduction. I'm saying. The two are don't mix up. The five thousand is no, nothing to do no, with that. No, no, sorry. Ten percent deduction. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. <coughs> okay. The every uh, end of the year only we are saying before December year end. Now we are calculating how much the. Salary and can no, you, you, need, you need to make a payment between March. No, you have to make the payments between March 18th and June 19th. Yeah, so we make the payment now. So between now this period, can we then for 10% we can claim that? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. No problem. It's a good question. Yeah, okay. The payment, the trick of this whole thing is the, the period, you must pay the eligible remuneration, which is a salary during the eligible period. During, mm -hmm. not before or after. Okay. That's the way the law stands now. Mm -hmm. So accruals and when you pay the bonus and debit shareholder loan, clearing of balances that we normally do, you can't do that. You have to make the payments now, which means they want to see source remittances being given to the government during this period for these eligible periods. Okay. Manu, okay. if you have accrued bonuses and if you are paying that now, I think it is eligible, right? Yes, because it has to be paid during the period. Yeah. Okay. If you wait till June 30th to pay it, then you're out on a December accrual, right? Because June 30th, if you pay the bonus June 30th, that you accrue yes. December for the December year end, you're out. You're out of the eligible period. Yes. Yes. Legislation calculates subsidies a minimum of three amounts. Max per employer is 25,000, fixed rate of 10% of remuneration paid to eligible employees and total remuneration of eligible employees multiplied by a fixed amount of 1375. Money. So the thing is what's important is that it's the employer who gets the 25,000, not the employee. Right, so if max each employee gets is thirteen seventy five, right, and this is by the way a free worksheet to calculate the wage subsidy that my good friend Jay Goodis, who helped me do the presentation, uh, has it on his website that you can go and download. It's a great, great, great tool. Okay, each employee does not have an individual subsidy balance. Each employee increased the wage subsidy available to the employer by thirteen seventy five. Here's how it works: you have twenty seven fifty, let's say. Eligible wage subsidy is twenty-seven fifty. Your source deductions are ten, so your net permittance is seventy-two fifty. This is how it works. Okay, the, generally this is how it works. Manu. Yeah. Just a quick question on the bonus. You just declare a bonus in December, and you take the pay the bonus in March or April. Are they eligible for the seventy-five percentage of too? 
So you can get both, yeah, if you get both, but then one will, the 10% will grind the 75%. Yeah, I know that you can offset it, but you will be getting 75% even if you declare a lump sum in December and paying in April. You have to pay it. Yeah, you have to, you have to pay it. You have to pay it in the, in the, um, in the period. And you have to pay it. Yeah. You have okay. to pay it in the March, April, May uh, period. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Um, so what happens if your source deductions are under the 10%? Well, then you can go apply for future payments to get the money, right? So let's say your 10% is lower than your source deductions. Then your future source deductions will be, can be held back, right? Um, you need 19 eligible employees to break even to get the $25,000 per employer requirement. Um, the $25,000 is not maximum limit per employer is not shared for an associate group of companies. You have to then consider allocating at least a dollar to each company, right? Which I'm dealing right now with a file, right? Even though one company has a loss, I'm still going to give it a business limit. Uh, the wage subsidy is taxable. It's included as income in the year in which the subsidy is received. It's like a government grant. So 12 one X inclusion. You need to keep information to support your subsidy calculations. So what's the total remuneration paid? The income taxes, the number of eligible employees paid in that period, what is an employee? Um, again, they're updating their reporting requirements as more information be released in the future. Okay. The one now that's the big one, the CEWS, which is a 75%. And this thing changed only, you can imagine, I did a webinar Tuesday and guess what? This webinar, the webinar on Tuesday is, sorry, and Tuesday is out of date compared to your webinar. <laughs> it's kind of silly, but because of this. Um, there's more backgrounders that are being released. Like it looks like it's be doing it on a weekly basis. Okay. So again, in a week or so, you can come back and check my website at www.cuckard.com for more updates. You can see it on my memo there. I know I've agreed to do another webinar for you guys, uh, for your association, uh, but at a date when we have more legislation and we don't know when that's going to be. Um, so May, why this is occurring is that this is when we're expecting to get the actual subsidy for 75%, right? That's what they said on May 31st when they announced this. They said, well, we're going to wait six weeks. Six weeks is mid-May, okay? But you need the money now. Um, we talked about the 10% wage subsidies that if you get the 10% for the, you know, you're going to get, you're going to reduce your CEWS and we don't know how. Uh, originally it was announced that the employer would not be able to eligible to claim the CWS for remuneration paid to an employee in a week that falls within a four-week period in which you got COVID. Now it's announced that the CWS, which is 75%, could be claimed for employees only where the employees have been paid for 14 consecutive days in the four-week period. Because of that, you're not able to, um, you're not, if, if they're being paid, uh, you're not getting the SERP, right? Now you can furlough employees, have them not work and, you know, um, and get $2,000 a month, right? So you can still do that. What are the individual employers? We talked about this. Individuals, corporations, partnerships, uh, nonprofits, charities, uh, public bodies like municipalities aren't there. So this is taxable corporation. So if you have a taxable corporation with a CCPC, non-CCPC public company, it, there's no SPD requirement, it, it qualifies. This has just changed yesterday um, that there has to be now uh, for March, a reduction in revenue of 15%. If you compare March 2020 over March 19, or you can do the alternate method comparison and compare the average of January and February 2020 to benchmark it. Okay, so you can do that because, like, some kind of, I have a client that said, Well, now this helps them that last year I doubled my business, but because compared to January and February, I'm behind in sales. Um, so, therefore, we have a, you have a 15% reduction. The period two, you have 30% compared to April last year or the average of Jan and Feb this year, same thing for May. The Jan to Feb this year is to, to pick up things where you have startup, we have a, we had companies that had explosive growth from prior year. This year now they're slowing down. This is how it is, okay? This is really new. This is like from yesterday. What does it include in the revenue calculation? You look at arm's length, not non-arm's length, which is a problem where let's say you have companies that service each other related companies, they're excluded from the drop. They're excluded from revenue. You use normal accounting method right? And we talked about this as of today. Um, they're, they've now allowed you for the purpose of CEWS that you can use cash or accrual method, which is interesting because they're saying for the purpose of CEWS only you can use cash or accrual. You have to pick one. But if you have, a, it doesn't say though that if you have a company that uses accrual accounting that you can't use cash accounting for CEWS. It doesn't say that. It just says for CEWS, you have to pick one or the other. So we're advising clients, well, pick your cash method if it's beneficial for you even though if you're using accrual for accounting purposes, right? For your financial statements. 
Excluding revenues from, include from revenues, extraordinary items and amounts on account of capital. Amounts on capital cows like capital gains. What could be an extraordinary item, an extraordinary revenue item that could be excluded that you could argue? Because obviously if you can show a drop in the current year, it's better. So what would be in the current year if you go to a client, he comes to you, hey, what would be an extraordinary revenue item? What would be an extraordinary revenue item you can exclude? Sale of a business asset. Okay, that would be considered capital usually, okay? On an income account, what would be a sale extraordinary item, extraordinary revenue? Anyone? Sa sale of a motor vehicle or asset? No, it's capital gain. Insurance claims? Huh? Insurance claims? Yeah. Yeah. Insurance claims is a good one. Very good one. Yeah, you have insurance, that's revenue to you, but like business interruption insurance or something. Yeah, you could do that. Let's say you got a finder's fee. Let's say I have a client who got over a million dollars and he got it because he was a finder's fee. He brokered a deal that he was going on for the last five years, but it's not part of his regular business operations. Would that be an extraordinary item? I'd argue yes. He never got it before, never get it again. How about Shred? No. Shred? No. If you're doing well, I mean the income from Shred, the credits? I mean, yeah. if you've been doing yeah. Shred regularly, you could argue Shred, maybe if you never did it before, it was a one-time thing. But I mean, if you've been regularly doing Shred, I'd say no. But I mean, it could be. This is where we don't know what extraordinary items are. Account mm. and capital, we know what it is. Mm. But that we don't know. So here we're looking at uh, month over month. You know, if we, if we go from the prior year or average of Jan and Feb, um, if their employer is established after February 2019, we have to look eligibly. We turn by comparing monthly revenues to re reasonable benchmarks. We don't know what that means. That's for startups. Here's some questions and concerns. 15, 30% revenue decline test for the month criteria unknown until the end of the month. How are you going to know to keep an employee on um, if you don't know until the end of the month to measure the 15 or 30% decline? What happens if you don't meet it? Let's say it only ends up dropping in March 14% and you kept the employee on. Then what are you going to do? All right, same for 29. Uncollectible receivables. This is now less of an issue if you're using the cash method. If you're using the cash method, right? You're using the cash method of, of, of accounting, we don't care about bad debt. But if we're using the accrual method of accounting for CWS, you do care because a bad debt expense is below the line, below the gross revenue line. Tracking arm's length revenue versus non-arm's length revenue, separate lines of business. Because this is 15 to 30% revenue per business. You can have multiple businesses in the company. Then what are you going to do? <clears throat> Invoicing is done annually, so you can't figure that out if you're using accrual. Live profit and loss statements, meaning that do you have um, uh, actual monthly profit and loss statements? Some clients don't have that. Some clients just do a bank rec every month, right, Dave? Like they don't do monthly profit and loss statements. So how are they going to know? You have to create them. That can be more work. Is the client going to pay you? <laughs> so here they've talked about, uh, they've expanded some things. They've expanded the CDWS to allowing 100% refund of employer paid contributions to EI, CPP, QPP, and QPIP. This refund we allow for each week in which any employee is paid but does not perform work. So you could have a situation, um, you could have a situation whereby, uh, you know, where, where you're having a situation whereby that uh, you have an employee that you're keeping but is not work, but is still working, they don't get the 100% refund, right? The refund is over and above the weekly maximum of 847 that was discussed, that was discussed earlier. Employee will need to collect and remit source deductions until such time as they apply for the refund, which is done concurrent with the application of CEWS. Work sharing program has been extended from 38 weeks to seven to 74, 76 weeks. That's a typo, not seven weeks, 76 weeks. Based on April 7th and pronouncement, EI benefits received by employees from the work share program will reduce the benefit that their employer is entitled to receive under the subsidy. This is not fair. Let's say I'm working, Dave is my employee. He gets $100 a week for five days a week, $60 a week for three days a week. He gets $40 of EI, right? Simple example. What they're saying is I'm claiming 75% of his 60, but then I'm also getting a grind for his EI of 40, but I'm already getting a reduction because my 75% is based on his lower wage. There's a double grind. It doesn't seem fair. Maybe they'll change. Here is the calculation. The calculation will cover up to 75% of the first 58,700 earned employment income earned CPP limit. Calculation of subsidy for arms length employers, the greater of lesser of two numbers, 75% of remuneration paid, 847 per week, lesser of amount of remuneration paid, 847 per week, and 75% of employees pre-crisis weekly remuneration. What this is telling me is that 
if I increase an arm's length employee's income, salary, let's say I had a normal raise that was going to occur on April 1st, and he was getting $600 on March 15th, but he got $800 as of April 1st through a normal raise that I got to give him, I get credit for his normal raise for the period on April, right? Because then I get the less, the, the greater of the lesser of 75% remuneration paid, I get that number, not the pre-crisis weekly remuneration. Um, Manu, if we accrue bonus in December 31st financial statements, and if the wages was, uh, the bonus has not yet been paid, and they say they are starting to pay whatever March, April, May, and June, what is their position? Do they have a problem? No, that's fine. You have to have the, you have to have the amounts, the, 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 um, the, the I'm just looking here at that question. Um, the bonus has to be paid. The amounts have to be paid. Yeah, but they did not have a normal earnings in January and February or March, for example. But I don't understand your question, sorry. Oh, no, the bonus was accrued in December 31st financial And then statement. they paid it, and then they paid it. Yeah, yeah, uh, just the bonus. He does not have a salary of January or February, so the bonus has to be paid in next six months. So let's say they start in March, yeah. April. No, but you don't, for January, February, you don't need a bonus. You need a decline in revenue. Yes. Right, you need a decline in revenue. So the bonus has to be paid. Okay. And then you have a decline in revenue. The 15 and 30% is a decline in revenue test. If you didn't have any salary, we don't care. Okay? Accrued don't count for the vote for the salaries. It has to be paid. Okay. They need you to pay the people. Why they want you to do this? They want you, if you accrue and you don't pay anybody, they're not going to give you a subsidy because you're not keeping people giving them money. You're not giving employees money. Yeah. No, you mentioned about uh, the person must be earning normal earnings before. That we're going to get That's into. Better. That's for non arm's length. Yeah, I'm talking for the non-arms length, yes. Yeah, so, Sorry. okay, so non-arms length is, yeah, so if you have non-arms length, you have a problem. If you never paid him, I get it. Okay, I understand your question. Yes, if you never paid him income, a non-arms length, that owner manager, you never paid him a salary before the pre-crisis, he doesn't get anything. So this is a problem with you, an owner manager being remunerated by, bon by um, dividends. You have a problem. Oh, no, I have mm -hmm. a question on that one. Yeah. Say the owner always took the salary in December. Yeah. And so now how do we establish if he didn't get paid in January, February? Yeah. And he wants to take the benefit of the subsidy. So he said instead of December, now I put it out in May, uh, April, March, April, May or whatever it is. Yeah. Is it or not you guys ask tough questions. We're Daisy, right? We ask tough questions. Um, I'm looking at the legislation here. The legislation, the backgrounder. Yep. It's only considered between January 1st and March 15th exclusive, inclusively, I knew they said this, for for given employees, the pre-crisis remuneration for a given employee would be based on the average weekly remuneration paid between Jan 1st and March 15th inclusively, excluding any seven-day periods in respect to which the employee did not receive remuneration. So if you paid them last year and not between Jan 1 and March 15th, you have a problem, which means what you need to do is pay them a bonus, pay them a salary in March, and pay the source deductions now. Or, or go back and amend your payroll and say that we paid him. But you're now not late for March, so you can pay him now. If you can't pay him, last year doesn't count. I didn't think it counted. No, so that's it, my question. If he gets paid in March, he's eligible to claim the subsidy on that, right? He's subsidy to get this. Yeah, as long as, no, no. If he gets a subsidy in March, before March 15th, that pre-crisis here, that pre-crisis remuneration, right? Yeah. That will then go, if you look at the periods, that will then factor in to how much he can pay during these periods in the claiming period from March 15th to April 11th, you still have to keep paying him. Yes, yes. Yes, yeah, that's yes. But he has to get paid. Whereas if you had an arm's length employee, you can pay him now and don't have to pay him before, but it doesn't matter. Okay. The difference is they don't want you to put in family members on the payroll that were never on the payroll before. Yeah, no, this owner was on the payroll, he has a track history of last 20 years, but he always took the salary only in December. You have to pay him now, you have to pay him, you have to pay him in January to March, more January 1st to March 15th. Okay, So if he got paid March 31st for the month of March, he no should good. be fine. No, 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 he has to pay, no, no, he has to be paid by yeah, March yeah. 15th, not March 31st. You're out. It says from Jan 1 to March 15th. I didn't say from to March 30th. For the period March 1st to March 31st, he got paid on March 31st? No, March 15th. 
Why don't why don't I write the check on March fifteenth and keep the write the check March fifteenth exactly don't worry about this March thirty first don't fool around with this stuff <laughs> <laughs> write the check March fifteenth man yes yes easy what's the difference man we're Daisy just put the date March fifteenth March fifteenth now here we're talking some Daisy tax right Daisy you guys know what Daisy is right so Daisy tax what's Daisy tax what's Daisy tax Dave. You're muted, man. You're muted. Oh, you're, you're, asking, muted. you're asking me? I'm asking everybody. What's Daisy tax? You are fully sleeping. You're I can't hear you? Your eyes are completely red and you're sleeping. My eyes are what? No, that's for somebody else, Manu. 730. Okay. I thought someone was commenting about my lack of my no, I no. slept. Okay. <laughs> no, no. That's a, it's a family matter. <laughs> okay. Okay. So March 15th. What's Daisy tax? Dave, where are you? You're, yeah, he ran away. That's good, Dave. You right away. Daisy tax is how do you backdate or effective date something without getting caught? <laughs> so tell me, how, what is the proper way if you're following proper Daisy tax planning? How would you date the check March 15th if you did this properly? How would you date it if it's today? Okay, is it by March 15th? Okay, March 15th, then hold the check and you know, cash it or put it back to the bag. Uh, Company account. Yeah, you have to hold. Yeah, you have to grab the check. You have to put it. In, you have to put grab it, the check it, in sequence. Sequence, that's right. So put it. If there it's out of put, sequence, what happens? Yes, then they will come and tell you. If you want <laughs> that's why I call this Daisy tax. The Daisy per the Daisy account that would pull the check off and say dated March fifteenth. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. So it's not March thirty first. No, it's March fifteenth. Yes. Okay. Good. So, yes. So here it is. It, it's so the, the lesser of, you see, the subsidy for non arm's length employees is the lesser of amount of remuneration paid 847 per week, 75% of employees pre crisis weekly remuneration. This prevents an employer from increasing a non arm's length salary post COVID, including increasing an increased subsidy. You must have been employed prior to March 15, 2020, and have a salary for non arm's length to be. This is a very big issue because I can tell you right now, the 75% practically, they're going to put family members on who are working the business or key employees. I don't see when most of my clients or my dad's clients, people working in the shop, they're not putting 75% for them. They're putting it for key employees and family members. I, mean, I don't know if you guys disagree. That's where I'm seeing people talking about using the 75% who are employers. So this is very important for the non-arms length because you got to make sure they're getting a salary before that date. Mm. Okay. I read yesterday, Ak Canada is bringing the 16,500 employees and they are going to do the 75%. They are? I didn't know. Yeah, so that was in the news I'm yesterday. Mistaken. I didn't know that. Thank you. I didn't read. Yeah, you I know what? I don't read this COVID news. Going to do the same thing. Who's going to do the same thing? Westjet. Who? Sorry? Westjet. Yeah. Oh, Westjet's West West doing the same yeah. thing. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. That's good. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy they're doing it. I'm talking though. What I'm talking about is I deal with private companies. I don't see most private companies doing this. Most small private companies doing this because I think that they're going to still have a cash flow problem because then they're going to have to front. Don't forget the money's coming in May. Where's the money going to come from now to pay them? <coughs> April, you're not getting any money. It's going to be in May you're getting the money. So I don't see most small private companies, and I'm happy Air Canada and WestJet are doing it because, you know, they were laid off, I think, 16,000 people otherwise. So they're going to, I guess, Air Canada and WestJet are not going to fly anyone. They're not making them work, but they're paying them, which is good. I'm happy they're doing that. So alleged remuneration must be paid between March 15th and June 6th. There's no employer cap. Employees will be expected where possible to maintain the existing employees' pre-crisis employment earnings. Employers will be eligible for a subsidy up to 75% of salaries and wages paid to new employees, arm's length. Does not include severance pay or items such as stock option benefits or post use of corporate vehicle. There's special rules for non-arm's length employees, which we talked about. How is pre-crisis wage or salary determined? So you're based on average remuneration between Jan 1st and March 15th. We talked about this. What is the calculation of, of the employees not on salary? How do you do it? Contractors versus employees. You can't have contractors. They don't count. Even if you put someone who's a contractor who's really an employee, he's screwed. How do you define employee for a week? Is it one day working, seven days? How do you do weekly count? These are just all questions, right? We don't know. Here's what you got to apply is on my business account. Now, this is an interesting scenario. I have a client who has a company who's a company in Buffalo. They have a branch in Quebec. They can't apply for this because they don't on the my business account for the directors. You need a SIN number. So they asked me, how am I, I don't know, the, the, the owners are American, but they have, a, they have a plant in Quebec and they have the employees here. I said, get a local guy to come in and represent you and use his SIN number, right? Anti-abuse, harsh penalties, imprisonment, government background or indicated penalty of 25% of the subsidy claimed. 
Spoken comments indicate penalty could be up to 225%. There could be prison time, according to Trudeau and Morneau, of five years if you screw around with a 75%. Future audits, again, make sure your, your claims are substantiated now. Don't just say, I'm going to take the money and run. Make sure it's audited and you justify everything. With the, the key thing is the calculation of the revenue drop. When are you paying non arms employees? That's very important that you, you justify this. What, what does spoken comments mean? Huh? What does spoken comments mean? Spoken comments mean Trudeau and Morno said the penalty was in written comment. It was 25% for the 70 yeah. of the subsidy. Trudeau and Morno said 225%. Oh, okay. So, but in writing, it doesn't say that. No, oh, yeah. Okay. So I'm just telling you that you're hearing two different numbers. Yeah. These are some alternate suggestions. We can talk back. I'm not going to get into that. Other measures, you guys in Ontario, your EHT exemption has been increased a million bucks, which is good. Okay, so that's good that you don't have to pay EHT now. Whereas in Quebec, it sucks because we have no EHT exemption. Okay, that's why I don't come and live in Quebec unless you want to speak French. I'm just kidding. Um, and that's about it. Those are my questions. And I think we've gone through questions throughout. You guys have usually been very lively crowd. It kind of helps that we all know each other, or I know, I know quite a few of you. So you're asking questions as we go. Are there any further questions? I'm glad, by the way, the questions were being asked as we went. Uh, Manu, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, back in the slide 22, you have example one. Dad, okay. mom, son, daughter. Yeah. Yeah. And omelets, right? Mm. So only dad, mom, and son works. Daughter is in the university now back. And uh, can I lay off the son and give the money to his daughter? And then son can claim the 2000? You want to go to jail? <laughs> no, I'm just asking. Do you want to go to jail? As my father would ask you. That's my father's famous. You remember my father? Have you remember you guys? You heard my, my, my bring my father in? My father said, do you want to go to jail? That's what he would say. No, don't do that. That's what he would say, yeah. That's so, uh, um, I have uh, two questions that's asked on the um, chat. Um, on the message, um, can I ask the questions yeah. to Manu right now? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> There's one question Greg asked. Can a shareholder of an investment company, i.e. No, no active income, and did receive non-eligible dividend, can then apply for CERB? Um, no, because they have to stop working in the current period uh, because of COVID, they're not. They're still. They're. They're still working. They're doing investment. I don't think that would. I don't think that would fly. You mean the five thousand dollar test from the dividends, the ineligible dividends? But you're stop. You haven't stopped working and not. You, I mean, you can say, okay, I'm stopping working because I'm not taking money out of my company. I'm not getting income. But you're still working in the investment holding company. You haven't stopped. I don't think. No, I don't think so. Now people are going to try it, but that's not what it's meant to be. Yeah. Uh, one more question. I think you covered this, but the, 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 there's a question. I have a nanny paid $4,800 on a T4 in 2019. $4,800? Yeah. And then another 1500 until March 15, 2020. Can she apply? You have and to look back 12 months. You have to look back 12, 2019. You don't. 12 months going back, you have to have 1500 and you have to see how much of that 4800 was earned in the last nine months of 2019. I did ask her that question. It seemed like she qualified because the payments were made between May and December 2019. Yeah, then she'd qualify. Yeah, then she qualified. Okay. I have uh, a question, Mano. For self employed employees, self employed yeah. people, if there's a revenue reduction, were there anything given to them on the, this uh, program? Which one? On this uh, SERP? Revenue reduction, there's none. For Only SERP, for there's none. We don't care about revenue reduction. The criteria is $5,000, stop working, and no income. It's an employee-based test, not an employer-based test. Um, one more question, Manu. Uh, on 18, employees were laid off. 18th of what, March? 18th of March. Yeah. And then uh, one week later, because of the, the compulsory shutdown, but then brought back because yeah. eligible or 
eligible corporate. Sorry, what is the word for that? Essential business. Essential business, yeah. So they brought back. In the meantime, they all applied for this 2000 benefit and EI. Yeah. They started getting paid this week. What yeah. their situation? They have to pay it back. They have to pay it back. Yeah, the period they, the period they were working. Can they call them and stop, uh, stop this or what? Pardon me? Can they call the CRA and stop it? They can try, yeah. But I don't know how that administratively works. They have to try to stop it. They have to, they have to, they have to pay it back at some point. I don't know if CRA is going to be in a position to do it. They probably don't know. At the worst Imanu. case, they should keep the money aside. Yeah. Hey, Manu. Yeah. Um, your example one, it says a company has ceased operation for COVID. Mm. That is the shareholder of the company. That's the assumption you're making on this example? Yeah, I'm assuming the example for the CERB is that the, sh the company has ceased and the shareholders have ceased. There, no one's working. Correct. But I mean, is the dad is the sh own, only child of the company. That's the assumption you're making in this example. Yeah, okay, sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Manu, I have two questions uh, that I asked um, that I'm going to uh, read it to you. Uh, one of them is if an owner works and there is not enough income generated to pay himself, but he paid the employees. Um, and the, in, normally the owner does get paid, but there's a drop in revenue. Can, and can he apply for the um, $2,000 benefit? He has to stop working. He has to stop working, okay. Uh, the next question is, I'm taking my salary on an annual basis say $120,000 and pay the payroll tax once a year on January 15th of the next year. Can my corporation eligible for 75% paid subsidy if I change my payroll to monthly and start paying uh, source deductions from April 2020? From, yeah, or well, from April. Yeah, you're paying in the eligible period. Yeah, provide you have a drop in revenue. Oh, okay. Uh, Manu, the drop in revenue is first period is 15% after that uh, is it I mean yeah it's 30% and 30% yes yeah. I thought it must be 15 but they're sticking no. not 30 yeah. um, okay. the, the other, sorry the other thing you mentioned about this uh, check sequence uh, about the desi accounting and all so if you have paid somebody then you can't do go back and do anything about that no, that's that's that. No, I'm talking about putting his check in sequence. Yeah, if you want yeah. to, if you want to backdate payments. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have, you have lost the sequence, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But uh, the question regarding that, man, you know, if the company is paying everything online just to have the check only to pay the salary only, there is two checks only, so they will be, they can still. That's date. different. Yeah. yeah. Then then yeah yeah okay that's different. Yeah. yeah that's and different. In the question question forty seven on the slide. Uh, yeah. This company having uh, you know seasonal work uh, and how they are going to say suppose they have most of the work starting from you know May, right? So April they were you know kind of a summer jobs they starting some April or May. So how are you going to compare that uh, thirty percent deduction for those kind of? Guys? You probably compare it to uh, the prior year. But they will not have that one because the seasonal one. No, but you can, oh, you would say it'd be seasonal in April. Yeah. Yeah. You're saying that you're only starting in May. So, and yeah, that doesn't work. I can't, yeah. I can't, yeah, I get what you're saying. You'd have to compare it. Well, you'd have to start in May. You have to compare May on. Yeah. Oh, okay. So May, you have May. May. You have to compare the third period. Okay. Anyway, thank you so much, man. It's a short notice. I know the last Thursday or something. I contacted you. Thank you so much for having <laughs> you. Uh, can I ask you a question? It. Sure. Hi, Kalpana. How are you? Hi. Good. How are you? Uh, okay, if, the, if there are four business account, but uh, only one payroll account, because uh, through one payroll account, uh, there are four business, and like employees are paid for other business, uh, this wage subsidy of 10 percentage is that maximum 25,000, can it be allocated, uh, can it be claimed for four companies or only one corporation? Sorry, you have four companies? But there is for business account, but there's only Where's one the business limit? For, for the 10%, you have to look at where the business limit is. If you have a business limit allocated to the four companies, you can yeah, each claim yeah, the business, 10%. Business limit, is, it is eligible. Assuming it's not ground, your small business deduction is not ground because of the large corporations tax. 
we are claiming a, we are claiming a small business deduction so you have to allocate at least one dollar to each of the four companies in the prior taxation year oh we had to allocate for yeah, each in the prior year. taxation year yeah yeah we can talk offline kalpana because i think i know your file right so okay okay thank you no problem and uh, sorry one more question um if we laid off staff and uh, now they are they are on serve and we want to hire them back and pay um with subsidy what is the earliest time we can do well i would do it right i mean the issue would be is if you want to hire them back then the issue is like we said is that they have to be paid if so if to get serve you have to be not you have to be let's look at this slide here um here. I'm going to go back to your question about the 14 days. Okay, wait. Uh, hold on, hold on. I'm just because I did there. Here it is. So, uh, slide 45. It was originally announced that an employer would not be able to claim the sir, the CWS for an employee remuneration paid to an employee in a week that falls in the four week period. It was subsequently announced that CWS would be claimed for employees only where employees have been paid for 14 consecutive days in the four week period. So, what you have to do is you've now let people go and they haven't been working for 14 days, presumably before they applied for the SERP, right? So that's what yeah. happened. Yeah. Now, when you apply for the CWS, you have to hire them and let them be paid for 14 consecutive days before you put them on again. So in your case, there's going to be 28 days that would have elapsed. Right? 28 days from the day. From the day, from the day they stopped working, then they claim serve after 14 days. So that's yeah. 14 days past. Then yeah. you hire them today. They have to wait another 14 days to get the CEWS. But they have already been paid for the month of April, right? That's what I heard. Yeah, yeah. They have. They have been paid for the month. They've been paid already for the hockey pay. For, they've already been paid for the whole month. No, they were. It was paid up to Ma April. Up to, up to March. It was paid up to March. Then they went on. Then they went on CWS. Sorry. Then they went on SERP, right? For April for seven days or whatever it was. So let's just say this: if they were paid for March, they can't be on SERP. They can't be on SERP. They have to be 14 days without payment. Let's say you go 14 days and then you apply. Or let's say you apply in advance and let's say CRA gives you the money. So until April 1st, to April 14th, they get the SERP. You hire them back on April 14th. It's only as of April 28th you can claim back. The, um, you can only claim back the um, uh, the CWS because they have to have worked 14 days. They have to have been paid for 14 days, consecutive days in the four-week period. It all depends on your facts, Kalpana. Okay, okay. That's a problem. You see the definition there? You have to be paid. So when does your four-week period start? You see what I mean? I can talk to you offline if you want. Yeah, okay, okay. So one last yeah, question. Yeah, but I'm just saying that there's an overlap. They're, they're, what they're trying to do is that if you've not been paid for 14 days, you get the CERB. If you have been paid for 14 days, you get the CEWS. But this is like, you have to apply it to your fact. They're doing this because they don't want you to double dip the C CERB and the CEWS. Yeah, yeah. So one last question, Manu. Thanks. We received uh, through the email uh, from Joseph. Uh, he says like a CERB, uh, $2,000 a month, $500 per week for four months will be given only who would not go for EI. In certain circumstances, EI will be more than $2,000 per month. Uh, in some cases, there will be three pay periods in April. Uh, also, if you calculate per hour CERB, uh, we'll have $12 and we are as EI, uh, we'll have more than certain higher earning group. Uh, in other words, government save more money on CERB plan instead of EI. Depends on who you, yeah, it depends on your facts. I mean, I can't comment on that. Depends. You obviously, you have to run your calculation on whether it's EEI versus CERB. The CERB, like in my other example with the kids, right, um, yeah. which is there, is that it benefits basically low-income earners. It doesn't benefit high-income earners. So sure, I mean, that, that falls into my example one. Yeah, I can't comment on that. Okay. It's not meant for low, it's not meant for high-income earners, the SERP. So Anything I else? Think, Are we good? Yeah. I think uh, we have come to the end of uh, the slides, I think, right? Yeah, Everything no, we're done. done, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was a very uh, terrific uh, presentation, Manu. And it Thank was, you. Uh, as uh, Dave mentioned, it was very short notice. Thank you. And uh, actually, it was a very informative and uh, engaging presentation.
Thank you. And um, thank you very much. And we will be a, a regular presenter for SAC and uh, we'll continue to be in touch with you. No, no, for sure. Thank you. Um, yeah. I'm glad I couldn't, I'm uh, sorry I couldn't meet you guys in person, but unfortunately that's the life, but um, at least yeah. we're on Zoom and uh, um, we will uh, be in touch again. Like I said, I promised SAC that we would have a, um, a second presentation when the legislation becomes clear on the 75% and that likely won't be for a couple of weeks. But like I said, if you go to my website, which I think is here. Uh, yeah, so that's my little picture. That's a joke here. So if you <laughs> see my website um, here, if you go there, mm -hmm. right? You have my email, you have my phone number, you have my website, go there to check on a weekly or you know, every bi-weekly basis for updates on COVID. Um, and it's there, it's free, it's just there as well. And you can pick it up. The, the, the memo talks about more details than were picked up in the slide. Right, there's over 20 pages of memo right now. There's two different memos, one on tax deadlines, one on emergency measures. So you can take there and you know, the, this is whatever. If you have, you can check there if you, if I don't speak to you in a month, if you wanna go check that website, you can see for, for more details because we do try to update on a weekly basis. And uh, I know a lot of people were asking about these uh, slides. The slides have been uploaded in our website, www.sac ontario.com if you go to our website you can download the slides and uh, thanks everyone for joining uh, today and uh, uh, I, my special thanks to Suresh Kumar from connecting GTA networking club for providing this uh, zoom facility to host uh, our webinar thank you and uh, thank you very much uh, Suresh and uh, continue to practice uh, practice the social distancing and fight against this virus hopefully we will get uh, through this soon Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.